Ready for the jury? Okay. All right. All right, Mr. Wigman, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. As soon as you ask him his first question, you should pop up there. He'll come right. up then. Yeah, cross-examination. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wigman, you testified that you closed a deal for Mr. Depp for Pirate 6 with him acting as Jack Sparrow. Do you recall that testimony? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Wiggum, could you do me a favor and just count from one to five for me so you, I can get you on my big screens here? Sure. One, two, three, four, five. I'm not getting this. There he there is. There we go. Okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I'm sorry. No. Okay. But in fact, Mr. Wiggum, it's not true that Mr. Depp ever had a contract with Disney for Pirate 6. Isn't that correct? Can you explain that question or that position? Have you ever seen a contract that provides for Mr. Depp to play Pirate 6? I, to the best of my knowledge, my memory, myself and my partner closed an, an optional picture deal for the amount of money of what that picture would be for Johnny. <sighs> And you would you would make sure to have that in writing, wouldn't you? You know, that would normally go through legal counsel in terms of the codification of it. Do you have any explanation for why there exists nothing, no piece of paper, nothing suggesting that Mr. Depp ever had a deal with Disney for Pirate 6? Objection, lack of foundation, compound. Oh, I'll allow it. <laughs> So uh, I often close when I was an agent, we, we would work on many deals where I actually wouldn't see contracts. They were verbal in nature. And then, you know, especially on, on optional pictures, just so there was an understanding of what the money would be. So do you have an explanation why there is not even a piece of paper, not an email, not a text, not a piece, not a document, nothing that suggests that Mr. Depp is going to be in Pirate 6 as Jack Sparrow. Objection, asked and answered. I, I don't believe it was. So overruled, I'll uh, it, I mean, if, if you're asking me my opinion, it wouldn't necessarily be alarming because that would be a conversation usually to understand Disney's gonna wanna know, are we on the same, uh, are we on the same uh, page about what the money's gonna be? And. Most of that conversation, if I remember correctly, was also with one of Johnny's lawyers at the time. Okay, and and so you you had so Johnny's lawyer was discussing this, but there's no document. Do you have an explanation I, for that? You may, well, you may know better than me if there is a document, but that that was Jake Bloom, you know, at the time, I believe, if memory serves me correct. All right. But you, would it be fair to say that you have never seen a document that provides that Mr. Depp was going to be in Pirate 6? It, it would be fair to say that it was consistent with a lot of the conversations that I would have on behalf of Big Stars, where it was verbal and there was an understanding of 
what the what the deal was going to be. Mr. Wiggum, if you could please answer my question. Objection, harassment. He did answer the question. I'll allow you to ask your question. Go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Judy, can, uh, uh, can, you, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Judy, can you read that back? Thank you. It, it, it would be fair to say that I have not seen a document on pirates. Now, just so you know, I don't, I, Mr. Wiggum, Mr. Wiggum, okay. I don't, I don't need you to give me extra. I just want you to answer mine. I just want to know, have you ever seen a document that says Mr. Depp is going to be in pirate six? I, I only to, to fully answer the question though. I think there's, there's some context. I, that's, 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 it, it would, that's an easy yes or no. Have that. you seen a document? Te technically, I, I perhaps have because it connects to all the other Pirates films. It's just a modification of a new document. So I, I have not seen 22.5 million written on a page. You're correct about that. Okay. Now, you, in fact, uh, had discussions back in 2016 and 2017 with Mr. Bailey, Sean Bailey. You talked about him a little bit ago, right? Yeah. And, and, and you also had discussions with Jerry Bruckheimer in 2016 and 2017, correct? Yes. About Mr. Depp potentially being in Pirate 6, correct? And then, yeah. you, and then you had discussions in 2018 with Mr. Bailey, and he was quite noncommittal about whether Mr. Depp would be in Pirate 6, correct? Objection hearsay. All right. Okay. Given that he was able to, I, uh, I'll sustain as to hearsay. It is okay. hearsay. All right. So you, so you determined, Mr. Wiggum, that by the fall of 2018, it was very likely that Mr. Depp was not going to be in Pirate Six. Is that correct? It's a two pronged answer from my perspective because there was really two individuals involved in that decision i would say jerry bruckheimer and sean bailey jerry bruckheimer in the fall of 2018 really wanted johnny in that next film and sean was non-committal as you said and mr bruckheimer made it clear to you that mr bailey was the one who gets to decide because he's disney right ultimately and he also wanted to be the tip of the spear to really try to convince Sean. Okay. Now, do you recall? Thank you. Thank you. Do you recall having your deposition taken on January 20, 2021? Okay. Yes, ma'am. With you. Okay. Can you pull that up, Michelle, please? Thank you. I'm going to ask you to turn to page 44. And Mr. Wiggum, you were under oath at the time of this deposition, correct? Correct? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Line 10. This is page 44, line 10. The question, do you recall approximately when in 2018 you inferred from Mr. your discussion with Mr. Bailey that the likelihood of Mr. Depp being in Pirate 6 was not high or was going away. And your answer at that time was, if memory serves me, the latter part of 2018, maybe. Question, when you say latter, is that any time from August to December, or what are you thinking? Answer, I would say fall, you know, maybe, you know, October, November, December, in that area. Do you recall giving that testimony under oath at that time? I, I do now that I see it, yes. Okay. And in fact, there were quite a few things going on earlier in 2018 that might have had a bit of an uh, uh, impact on Mr. Depp's reputation. Would you agree? Uh, if you, it might help if you... Refresh I, your not, recollection? Sure, sure. But And before I go there, though, I think you said 
that the reason it was so catastrophic for Mr. Depp for the op-ed was because it was a first-person account of Johnny, right? Do you remember saying that? Yes. Okay. Wasn't it a first-person account when Ms. Heard filed for the TRO in 2016? So that, that would have predated any relationship I had to Johnny, so I had no knowledge of that. Okay, so you don't know whether it was catastrophic then? It, I, I, if you're asking me my opinion on, on something I don't know, I can form an opinion right now. Uh, it's a court document and probably a little different than an op-ed in the Washington Post. Um, but I would agree it's not a, now that I'm forming an opinion, that it's not a great headline for sure. When you read the op-ed, did you read it online or did you read it in the actual Post paper? I don't remember. Well, let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 2. Does this refresh your recollection? Very hard for me to see. Is that is that just the can, paper? Can we, we're going to try to scroll in a little bit more. Again, just if you can help me. I, is that the paper? Is yes. That the article? Yes, that's the Washington Post. So, uh, what's the question? Sorry. Do you re does this help refresh your recollection of whether you saw it in print or whether you saw it online? It does not, but I'll tell you that I did not typically pick up the Washington Post, you know. Okay. And so while we're sitting, if, if you can, just for a second, uh, you're saying that then two years ago I became, oops, I better not do that. Let's uh, clear that one. Then two years ago I became a public figure representing domestic abuse. That's this first person from Ms. Heard that's catastrophic for Mr. Depp. Is that your testimony? My testimony is that it reads like a victim statement from someone involved and the recipient, and it became a, a yes, a bit of a death nail, catastrophic thing for Mr. Depp in the Hollywood community. All right, well, let's go to, let's pull up Defendant's Exhibit 99. Now, there was, in fact, an article published in the Sun newspaper by Dan Wooten, the editor-in-chief, on April 27, 2018. Do you recall that? Now that I'm looking at it. Does that, that refresh your recollection? And, in fact, yes. this article calls Mr. Depp a wife-beater, does it not? Objection hearsay. I, I'll allow it for the. Uh, you know what? I can't. I can't see the print, even with these glasses. But. Uh, All right. Well, we'll. I'll take your word for it. Well, the the title here is "How Can J.K. Rowling Be Genuinely Happy Casting Wife Beater Johnny Depp in the New Fantastic Beast Film?" Objection. Do you see that? Your Honor. I, I'll allow that. Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I'd like to move the admission of this exhibit. I, I think at this point it's not offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but it's going to offer it. He's testified to he, comparisons of other articles. He, he's, he's testifying to the impact of the op-ed. I think it's in fairness we should be able to put this in and be able to make the comparisons. It's clearly hearsay. Your Honor. Okay, I'll sustain the it's objection. It's not offered to prove I'll the truth of the matter asserted, Your I'll Honor. I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Well, let's go to... The third page, now let's go to the fourth page, so it has A5, I think is what I'm trying to get to, so it says paragraph 7. So do you recall that it says in here, 
Um, Objection hearsay, Your Honor. Your Honor. She's just trying to backdoor your ruling. Mr. Wiggum, the article also had pictures, did it not? I don't recall. Do you recall whether it had a picture of Ms. Hurd? Jackson hearsay, Your Honor. I'll, I'll allow that. Do you, do you I don't recall. Can we go to the eighth page? I'm showing you the picture right now. Does that refresh your recollection? Your Honor, uh, hearsay, lack of foundation. Yeah, I'll allow it. It, it. it doesn't speak to my impression of when I read it or how I read it, but I see the photo. Yes, ma'am. All right. And in fact, it shows bruises on it, doesn't it? On Ms. Hurd's face? Objection, lack of foundation. Overruled. That would be what I see, yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Depp filed a lawsuit against the Sun newspaper and against Dan Wooten for this article, correct? I, I believe so. June 13, 2018. Let's pull up uh, 1599, defendants 1599. Does this refresh your recollection? Objection, hearsay, Your Honor. Um, uh, just for refreshing recollection, I'll allow. Uh, I, I'm, just so I understand the question, you're asking, does it refresh a memory that Johnny <laughs> filed against the son? Yes, and Dan Wooten. On June 13, 2018. Uh, sure. Uh, Okay. Now that I'm looking at it, yeah. All right. And he did so in the UK, in the High Court of Justice, correct? I believe so. You, oh. you would know better than I. Okay. And if we can just turn to page nine. And do you recall that Mr. Depp alleged that that article had caused him serious harm to his personal and professional reputation? Objection, hearsay, calls for speculation. I'll allow the question. Thank you. No, I don't recall. I'm going to ask you to take a look at paragraph 11. And let me see if I, I can need get... new glasses. Okay. Sorry. I can barely... I'm gonna... I wish, Your Honor, I... is there a way to even make that screen bigger on mine? I wish I was had better glasses they... and more technological stuff. They can make it a little bigger, but I think that's about as far as it can go. I'm going to try to highlight it here so that that might help you a little bit. Let me switch the color. But So do you recall that Mr. Depp alleged that the article by in the Sun newspaper by Dan Wooten had caused serious harm to the claimant's personal and professional reputation? If you're asking me, I, I don't recall it. I was not involved in that case at all. Uh, I'm able to read what's in front of me. But you don't recall it, and you don't recall if that had any impact on, on Disney in 2018. Ob objection asked and answered. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. All right. Do you recall that Mr. Depp also alleged that he was caused significant distress and embarrassment by the publication of that article? No, that I don't recall that. Okay. I, I, I see that because I just was not involved in that case. I, All right. My memory of, of that was it was a, a tabloid, so, and the, the lawyers were handled. All right. Michelle, you can take that down. Thank you. Now, there was a trial in the UK. Was there not on Mr. Depp's 
claims of libel against Dan Wooten and the Sun? I believe so. And it was in July of 2020, was it not? I don't remember the date, actually. All right, and it lasted three weeks? Do you recall that? I don't, but I'll take your word for it. Do you recall there being an enormous amount of publicity surrounding that trial? Ob objection calls for speculation, uh, lack of foundation. Uh, he said he did. Thank over, you. Over. I'm sorry, Mr. Wiggum, you said you did recall that? Ask and answer. I'll allow it. I, I remember there being press around it, yes, ma'am. Okay, and in fact, uh, do you recall that Mr. Depp gave testimony for four days? Not specifically, I don't. Do you recall that Ms. Hurd gave testimony for four days? I, I don't recall any specific, specific memory of who testified or how long or any, any details within the case. Do you recall there being many, many witnesses testifying at that case? on that case? I think I'd revert to my answer just now. Okay. And the press that surrounded that case, do you recall it being, uh, focusing on things like Mr. Depp's drug and alcohol use? S same answer. Do you recall there being the video, the kitchen video being shown repeatedly? Ob objection. Your Honor, may we approach? Sure. I think my last question was, do you recall there being a lot of publicity surrounding Mr. Depp's alcohol and drug use? I, I think I answered that. Oh, that right. That's right. I was on I the video, recall. the kitchen video. Do you recall there being the, the kitchen video being played pretty repeatedly in the press? No, I don't. Do you recall a lot of pictures of Ms. Hurd reflecting bruises, cuts, injuries I, I think I, just to be clear I, I don't recall anything that was going on within the case I was always consumed with next film and TV opportunities and that was being handled by the lawyers do That's you my memory do you recall I just have a couple more to ask you on this do you recall there being allegations of at least 14 incidents of domestic violence against Ms. Hurd in that trial? I do not, with specificity, same answer. Now, could we bring up exhibit number one again, plaintiffs? Now, Mr. Wiggum, do you know who wrote Amber Heard, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath, this has to change? You're talking about the title? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say that I, to me, I, I would have assumed it was Ms. Heard. You assumed, but you don't know, do you? I do not. Okay. And were you aware that there were also three pleaded incidents of sexual violence in the UK trial against Ms. Heard by Mr. Depp? No, ma'am. Okay. Now, your testimony is, you can take that down, no, thank you. Your testimony is that since some point in 2020, uh, Mr. Depp has not had any 
uh, more movie opportunities. Is that correct? Since, sorry, re repeat the date. When is the last time Mr. Depp had a movie opportunity? The last film that he shot was Minamata, to the best of my memory. All right. And in fact, do you know whether the, uh, the, the article that was in the UK, the ensuing lawsuit that was brought by Mr. Depp, and the ensuing trial and all the publicity, do you know whether that had any impact on Mr. Depp's career? Objection compound. Uh, all right, I'll sustain the objection. Do you know whether the collection of all of those items I just listed had an impact on Mr. Depp's career? If, remind me of the dates that you're asking about? So, so the answer, I, I take it, is no, you don't know, correct? If, I, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I give you a, a correct answer so I understand the question. You referenced after 2020. Okay. the that what you're saying? The, the article was April of 2018. The lawsuit was June of 2018. The trial was July of 2020. What opportunities has Mr. Depp had since July 2020? Since July 2020, he has not uh, done a film. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right, redirect. <laughs> Good afternoon again, Mr. Wiggum. Uh, do you recall Ms. Bredehoft asked you uh, questions about whether you ever actually saw a document uh, containing the $22.5 million deal for Mr. Depp for Pirate 6? Do you recall that? I do. And do you recall when you were trying to answer her question, you said you needed a little more context? Do you recall that? Yes. And would you please now provide the jury that context so they can have a fuller understanding of what your what your testimony is? So often on a franchise movie, when you're dealing with big stars and you're talking about future optional pictures, uh, you engage at the high level, uh, meaning the president or the, the top of the studio to get an understanding of what that deal is going to, going to be. They then get papered, typically, when I say papered, it amended, because it's, it's based on the same contract, usually, that's been in existence. And it would get, sometimes we don't see paperwork or get paperwork until the film is happening. And, oh. and Mr. Wiggum, on a similar line, uh, Ms. Bredehoft asked you some questions about whether after this deal was done, it was uh, starting to trend badly with respect to Disney and not so, and, and, what, and still well with respect to Mr. Bruckheimer in the fall of 2018. Do you remember that testimony? I do. When was it that Disney made the final decision as to whether Mr. Depp would be in Pirate 6. Objection. I'll sustain the objection. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. M Mr. Wiggum, it, it may have been trending badly as of that time, but Disney had not gone in, in the other direction, correct? Objection. No. So the, the Overruled, email you showed me earlier. You may, you may continue. The email you showed me earlier was two days after the op-ed and and I was saying that Disney had never Objection. said that Johnny would not be oh, in oh, the film oh. as of that date. Overruled. Right. And my, it, it was, my testimony is the exact same as the deposition, which is it was trending badly in the late fall on behalf of Disney, but I was, but Jerry Brockheimer 
and I were lobbying to make it happen. And so we had hope and it became clear to me in early 2019 that it was over. Thank you very, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggum. No further questions. All right. Thank you. Is this witness subject to recall? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Wiggum, since you're subject to recall, you're still subject to the rule on witnesses, so you cannot discuss your testimony with anybody and you cannot watch any of the trial. Okay, sir? Okay. All right. But you're free for today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Your Honor, before we call the next witness, may we approach briefly for okay, a moment? Okay, sure. Good. How are you doing, sir? Good afternoon. You can sit down, sir. That's fine. Good afternoon, Mr. Marks. Uh, good afternoon. Would you please state your full name for the record? Richard Edward Marks. And Mr. Marks, where do you live? I live in Hollywood. Would you tell us a little bit about your educational background, sir? I'm, I'm a product of the um, public school system in Los Angeles, uh, and I went to uh, UCLA undergraduate, and I'm a graduate of the uh, UCLA School of Law. When did you graduate from UCLA School of Law? I graduated in uh, 1973, and I've been an officer of the courts uh, since then almost 50 years. Where do you work? Uh, I work at uh, my own law firm, Richard Marks and Associates. What is Richard Marks and Associates? Uh, it is um, a transactional entertainment uh, law firm, and we represent individuals, uh, writers, directors, actors, books, uh, but uh, authors. But mainly, we represent uh, producers who are developing a, a product, if you will, to be produced and then exploited on television, features, streaming, things like that. When you say a transactional law firm, what do you mean by that? Uh, what I do is make deals. They're transactions. I'm a deal guy. So my whole practice all these decades has been about getting to yes. How do you make a deal? And then how do you get it documented so people sign it and then are able, it's clear enough that it can be administered uh, and people can know what to do after you've made the deal. Specifically, what types, types of clients do you work with? Well, as I said, um, uh, I, I work with all kinds of clients, but the, the, my bigger clients and the bulk of my practice is representing producers uh, who produce, they develop and they produce content for exploitation. Are, are there any particular clients that you can identify? Yeah, I've been working for a long time uh, with uh, uh, ITV, uh, which is a, a, a huge British company with worldwide uh, reach in uh, entertainment. They produce uh, The Voice, Love Island. And right now, I've done all the uh, development legal work on a miniseries that's about to shoot in uh, France and England, starring Michael Douglas as Benjamin Franklin. It's based on a novel that we optioned, I helped them option years ago. Then scripts were written for the eight hours. Then Michael Douglas was engaged. The director was engaged. And I do all those contracts. And that's ITV. Um, another one of my uh, uh, big clients is Village Roadshow. They're an Australian company. Um, they, they partner with Warner Brothers. And they produce movies like Matrix, uh, 
Aquaman, Scooby-Doo. Uh, right now, I am working on a television series for them doing the legal production, and, and before that it was development, but the production legal work on a reboot of the old uh, College Bowl uh, show where two colleges come together with teams and answer questions, and, and here they're going to win scholarships. And the hosts are uh, Peyton Manning and Eli Manning. So that's currently what I'm working on for Village Roadshow. Any other clients? And I would say my, my third uh, big client is uh, a company called uh, Media Rights, MRC. Uh, and they, they produce movies and, and TV shows. Recently, I've, I've done a lot of work for them. Uh, they are finishing up a, a, a miniseries that I'm doing the legal work on for Apple, starring Billy Crudup. Uh, we just finished a, a miniseries for them called Terminal List with Chris Pratt. Uh, that's for Amazon. Uh, and, and we recently finished um, a, a, a miniseries doing the legal deal-making uh, for MRC um, on, a, on a show uh, called The Shrink Next Door, which is aired. Uh, it um, uh, starred Will Ferrell and uh, Paul Rudd. And then I, I, you know, I can't leave out uh, uh, my longest client, which is the producers of uh, Bosch uh, for uh, Amazon. Uh, it's got to be nine, ten years ago when we w went into Amazon. They had never produced a series, and we negotiated a deal for uh, Michael Conley's book series. Uh, and uh, we cast uh, Titus Welliver as Bosch. They wouldn't order a series, they would only order a pilot. And now, uh, in the next few days, what I call the eighth season, but which is the first season of the spinoff, will uh, be available on IMBD TV instead of on Amazon. But Amazon owns IMDb TV. Uh, and, um, and we're in right now writing the, uh, the ninth season. So. I've had this long run with this um, uh, one particular uh, series. Can you tell the jury a little bit about the types of deals that you work on for these clients? Well, it, when you think of, a, of, a, of a, a series or a motion picture, uh, and you see the credits, there's hundreds of, of credits there. And every one of those people you have to make a deal with them, and you have to paper it so that they, they sign it. And you know what to pay them, and what, what is there a guild involved, a union? Uh, you know, what are their services? And um, what I do is all of that, soup to nuts, uh, uh, many times. Sometimes I work with in-house counsel or other attorneys, and we split up the work. But basically... Uh, you know, you want to produce a, a movie or a show, you, you might option a book. I do that deal. You might hire a writer. Uh, then you might get a director, then, then a line producer, a UPM, a first AD. Then you start hiring your cast. Then you start making location deals. Uh, then you start renting equipment and props and getting releases for photos you might show, or for people who might end up on camera. Uh, and then when you're done shooting, you're making deals for uh, merchandising and deals with distributors. And uh, in the old days, it was might have been for a DVD or for merchandising, a doll. Uh, and so it's really what I do is make deals. And all deals... Uh, I've been doing it for almost 50 years, but they're all the same. They have elements of time, money, credit, rights, and perks. And I have approached deals that way so that I've made myself relevant. When I started out, there were three networks and big studios. And an attorney said, well, I'm a TV lawyer or I'm a feature lawyer. I just said, I'm a transactional lawyer. And so I've been able to adapt and make deals with Netflix, Quibi, YouTube, uh, uh, you know, you name it. I've, I've made deals. 
I mean, I recently made a deal with uh, Hellman's Mayonnaise for an actress who is going to be an influencer for them on the web. And it was a, you know, high, it was a good payday for this actress, but that's the way I look at deals. I'm a deal maker, and that's my practice. Mr. Marks, you testified that you um, have been working in the entertainment industry almost 50 years. How yes. did you get started in the entertainment industry? Uh, I got started in the entertainment industry by being born in Hollywood, and it's our, uh, it's our town industry, if you will. And uh, I've always been interested in it. And uh, when I went to UCLA, I took uh, all the film classes there were. Uh, and when I went to UCLA Law School, it was by design because number one, I couldn't afford the, the, the big law school. So UCLA was a public school, it was virtually free. I went to UCLA Law School because if you wanna practice entertainment law in Hollywood, those, you go to UCLA or USC. Those are the, the schools where you kind of create your contacts and your, your network. Uh, and at UCLA, they had some of the best professors who taught entertainment law-related subjects. So I took copyright, trademark, uh, entertainment contracts, if you will. I took everything entertainment-related. Um, and... And that's how I kind of built the foundation for then my after law school career. What did you do after you graduated from law school? Well, I, um, I wanted to do entertainment transaction law, but I realized that I could earn a little bit more money if I went into entertainment litigation, uh, suing over copyrights and trademarks. And so I took uh, the highest paying job out of, that I could get out of law school and was uh, uh, in 1973. And I, I did IP litigation, disputes over copyrights, uh, trademarks, uh, disputes over rights, things like that. And I was a low level litigator um, doing depositions or motions, uh, certainly not sitting at the, you know, uh, examining witnesses, except it might be in a deposition. And, and, I, and I did that uh, for about, it was my first year out of law school. What did you do after that? Uh, well, after that, I, I kind of made a decision that uh, uh, being a litigator wasn't for me, uh, that I wanted to make deals that I wanted my career to be about getting to yes. Uh, and that involved a lot of uh, uh, you know, conflict sometimes, but the goal was to get to yes so that um, both parties could work together. Because the goal was working together and creating the TV show, not making the deal. The deal makers had to step away so that you closed the deal and then people could live with that deal. And um, so I went to a, a, a transactional law firm, and um, uh, I was there a couple of years, and, and I made deals. What kind of projects did you work on when you transitioned into that uh, deal-making role? Well, this is, um, you know, uh, mid-1970s, and this law firm uh, uh, was hot, if, if you will, and uh, some of my Classmates were there. That's how I got the job. I had to take a cut in pay to go there. Uh, and um, I, I'll never forget, I'm the second chair attorney in a big conference room at Fox, and we're trying to close a deal for our young client, George Lucas, to make a film called Star Wars, a, a, a Western space movie. And Fox would not give us the budget or the salary he wanted. And this is the God's honest truth. We said, okay, give us the merchandising. And famously, they gave us the merchandising because they didn't think there was value there. Uh, and that's how much our business has changed. Uh, while I was at uh, that, my first transactional firm, we also worked uh, for a client. His name is Sylvester Stallone. He, his claim to fame is that he was a uh, character actor, but he had written a script that all the major stars wanted to play. They wanted to play the role Rocky, 
And he said, I will not sell this script unless I play Rocky. And no one was happy about that. And the deal we made was uh, he got to play the role, but it was a very low budget, and he hardly had a dressing room. He hardly had any perks. He wasn't happy about it, but we were able to make up for that in the deals for Rocky II, III. And, and, and that's the type of deals. It was, we, at that entertainment transactional firm, we weren't representing um, uh, major companies, if you will. We were representing artists, uh, uh, writers, d directors, talent, like, um, uh, you know, individuals. We weren't representing the, the companies I do now, like ITV or Village Roadshow. How long were you at that law firm? I was at that firm uh, for a um, couple years. What did you do after that? After that, I made a decision that um, uh, I, I, I wanted to go in-house where the full-time business was making a, you know, product and it was very tied to production and, uh, and I, was, I wanted to move away from law firms at that moment. And, and my first in-house job was for uh, the Ziegler Discan Agency, uh, which was one of the premier literary agencies in town. We, we represented writers and books and estates of books. And at that time, uh, in late 70s, early 80s, if you wanted to hire a writer or a book, uh, or option a book, there were three places you went. Uh, you went to Swifty, which he's kind of famous, Swifty Lazar's Oscar parties, or you went to uh, Swanee, H.L. Swanson, or you went to Ziggy, and I worked for Ziggy. Did you work for any other companies in an in-house capacity as a deal maker? Oh yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, uh, w with Ziggy, uh, uh, we made deals for the book *The Princess Bride*. We 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 did a lot of. Uh, we worked for William Goldman, who that was his book and his screenplay, and uh, you know, it was a fabulous experience. But uh, that firm was bought by. Um, uh, ICM, a much bigger agency, and then I moved to Paramount. That's what I, where I, I next went. And at Paramount, I um, uh, was the uh, attorney on the series Cheers and the series Family Ties, which was uh, the, the break for the, the young son, Michael J. Fox. Um, and then I did something because I have never... Um, said I'm just a TV lawyer. I'm a deal maker, I get to yes. And it's sort of unheard of, uh, but I moved from network television doing the deals for Cheers and Family F Times. I moved to f features at Paramount uh, because you could earn a little more money in features. Uh, and I was married and uh, I, I had a child. And, um, and in features, uh, I was assigned to do the development and production work for a producer who's in this case, Jerry Bruckheimer. Uh, and, um, and I also uh, served, uh, they had an overall deal with Eddie Murphy. So I, I did his, the legal work on his films like Beverly Hills Cop, uh, Coming to America, things like that. And I, and I was at Paramount about four years. Where'd you go after Paramount? Uh, after Paramount, I got this opportunity to head up business and legal affairs in the feature division for Jerry Weintraub's studio. Jerry was famous at the time for Karate Kid and Ocean's Eleven, and he represented, uh, you know, Elvis and Frank Sinatra in music and John Denver. But this was his motion picture company. And, uh, and I uh, was in features, and um, uh, at, we, we made a film called Troop Beverly Hills, which was starring Shelley Long. Uh, we made uh, another film, The Big Blue. We acquired a film library. He was positioning himself to be a major company until he went bankrupt. 
uh, and that was one of his only failures. Where'd you go after that? Uh, after um, uh, Jerry Weintraub, I went to uh, Disney and I filled in for a year for the head of legal and features who was on maternity leave and taking a family leave. And so I uh, headed up uh, legal on f films like uh, Dick Tracy, Madonna was in that, uh, uh, Rocketeer, another live action film. But what I really remember about my time at Disney is they were revamping the um, animation department and they wanted to make a different kind of Disney animated film. And part of it, in the old days, Disney animated films, um, the, um, the voices weren't advertised. They weren't the stars of the movie. Disney was the star or Dumbo was the star, but the voices were hardly known. And we broke that mold, and it was the, the first deal where we paid real money to someone to do a voice. It was a deal I made uh, with um, uh, uh, Robin Williams to voice uh, Aladdin. And it changed the whole history of Disney and feature animation. I worked on uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, and, and it, was a, it was a tremendous experience uh, to, to be involved with them. After you worked at Disney, did you continue to fill in-house uh, deal-making roles? Yeah, I continued my in-house uh, road, even in the world that I could see was consolidating, and it was going to be more and more difficult to stay in-house. Um, after Disney, I went to a company called Media Home Entertainment, and they um, put up money for films, and for their investment, they got the VHS cassette rights. So the, uh, Media Home Entertainment was one of the producers, investors in the Nightmare on Elm Street series and Blue Velvet. And what they got was the right to sell uh, video cassettes. They also manufactured and sold the Jane Fonda videos or the NFL videos. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great business, except the studios realized, are we crazy? Why are we letting another company sell video. We should keep that in-house. And so I was uh, not only head of legal, but I was on the board of directors, and we sold the company to, to Fox so that they could take in the assets and eliminate a, a, a competitor. Where'd you go after that? Um, after Media Home Entertainment, I went to a company called Kushner Locke, it was very, it, it was at a time in the business there were hundreds of independent producing companies because the networks couldn't produce for themselves. There were laws preventing it. Uh, and Kushner Lock, we produced um, Pinocchio with Jonathan Taylor Thomas. We produced a small movie called Freeway. It was Reese Witherspoon's, one of her first roles. Uh, uh, and it was, um, you know, I was there for eight years. It was a, a good long run uh, until uh, they, um, as all those independent companies ultimately did, not all, most, they, w he, they went bankrupt after eight years. What did you do after that? Uh, now, you can see I'm still chasing the in-house uh, uh, world. Uh, I went to a company, Nelvana. They were a, a, um, a Canadian animation company, but they had this big office in LA. I headed up business and legal. Uh, we manufactured, um, made, produced uh, uh, animated uh, television series like Care Bears and, and merchandising also. Uh, Babar, uh, Big Bear, Little Bear, uh, all sorts of uh, animated uh, subjects uh, and merchandising deals and cartoons, if you will. And um, uh, then that Canadian company closed the LA office and moved back to Canada. I didn't want to move back to Canada. And so my last in-house situation, I went to uh, Universal Network Television and I did business and legal affairs on uh, just Shoot Me, a uh, television series, uh, uh, a series uh, starring Josh Brolin called Mr. Sterling, 
It was kind of patterned on Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Um, and at the same time I was at uh, uh, Universal Network Television, I, um, I consulted uh, with uh, Nickelodeon Features and um, I, um, uh, I, I, I helped them sort of build out their, their feature uh, uh, products. They were on the Paramount lot. I had been at Paramount for a long time and we worked on films such as SpongeBob, the animated film. Uh, and then when, when that consulting ended and NBC came in and bought Universal, that you know, ended my, my job at Universal and I made the decision I would go back and be a, a, a lawyer at a law firm. What types of work were you doing when you went back to the law firms? When I went back to the law firm, I, um, I did uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I worked on their clients uh, and uh, I, I helped a, a financier, Robert Sillerman, in effect buy the American Idol brand. I worked with uh, uh, Barry Gordy's company it, trying to turn some of his world into th theatrical plays. Uh, I worked with the Nat King Cole estate uh, trying to, to do things. Uh, so it was a lot of reality. I remember uh, I worked with Walt, J. Walter Thompson uh, and they, um, they were uh, in effect creating advertising opportunity branding and then the one that sticks in my mind is I, I helped you know George Foreman market things so that he made a deal to be the face of a thing called the George Foreman grill and and it was a it was a it's a good practice Mr. Marks you testified that you now are at a law firm called Richard Marks and Associates when did you start that firm well after the firm I just told you about was called Greenberg Traurig. Uh, it's a large international firm. I moved to uh, a firm called The Point Media in um, 2006, and I was there for 14 years, uh, doing much the same work that I do now. And then in 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, I went out on my own and formed Richard Marks and Associates. Over the course of your career, um, what, if any, changes have you observed in the deal-making space in the entertainment industry? Well, before I got involved in the business, most deals for writers were uh, how much money per week and how many weeks. When, when I got into the business, it was already more complicated. But through my decades, all that's happened has gotten more and more complicated still the essential elements of time, money, credit, um, uh, perks, uh, money, uh, whatever, but it's gotten more complicated. You had to deal with merchandising, you had to deal with sequels, you had to deal with all sorts of derivative works, video games, you name it, uh, you know, publicity, promotion. It all expanded so that making a deal that might have been, you know, simple, 30 years before, now was a, a major production. And, uh, uh, you know, lawyers became integral. You couldn't get a, do a deal without someone who was going to dive into the, the boilerplate and make sure that it was right. Your Honor, I'm about to switch gears a little bit. I don't know if you would like to break now for lunch. That's or fine. If you could approach us for a moment. Okay. Just Your Honor, before we take lunch, plaintiff would move in uh, Mr. Marks as an expert in the entertainment industry. All right, any objection? No. All right, so moved. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and take our, our lunch then. Uh, please do not talk to me, anybody and don't do any outside research. We'll see you back in an hour, okay? Thank you.
Mr. Barks, if you could just stay there for a second, sir. Stay there for a second. Just stay right there. Thank you. No problem, sir. All right. Sir, since you're in the middle of your testimony, you cannot talk to anybody about your testimony at this time, including any lawyers or Mr. Depp, okay, sir? All right. All right. Then we'll be back. Then we'll be back at, let's make it 2 o'clock, okay? All right. Thank you.